So, okay. Hello, thanks for inviting me here. So, I'm the first experimentalist here, so you have to be a little bit brave. So, there will be a lot of figures and not so much equations. And, and experimental physics is a little bit different. So, we need actually big teams to do something. So, me alone would do nothing. So, we are from. It's on. Better? Okay, good. So I am from Stuttgart. Uh, I'm working in the group of Tilm am V as a group leader, and we have two experiments I want to talk about. It's uh, Ultra Cold Experiment 1 and Ultra Cold Experiment 2. And there's a large list of people we have here, and there's also a large list of collaborations, uh, mostly theory person. Uh, and I will not go into detail who, which person has done what. Uh, I just want to give you an overview. So, um, the talk will be about Rydberg atoms, and you see here a simple picture of a Rydberg atom. It looks a little bit like the logo of the ICTP, but uh, I asked already one guy if this is an atom. Is there anyone from ICTP who knows what this logo actually is? So, this is uh, my view of a Rydberg atom, a very simplified picture. And in the talk, I will first talk about the properties of Rydberg atoms and how they interact, and I will mostly refer to work of other people. Now it's <laughs> Perhaps you put it somewhere. Okay, is that good? Okay, better now? Thanks. So, <laughs> so, um, and then I will talk a little bit about Rydberg molecules in the second part. So here are my favorite properties of Rydberg atoms. So what we have here is uh, for Rydberg atom is a highly excited atom in a high quantum number. So I have chosen here the 100s state. And the size of this atom is already one micron. And to give you an idea how big one micron is, so if you have a 100s state that we can produce in our lab, then this size really is comparable to something like bacteria and stuff like this. So this is a macroscopic object, but still it's in a pure quantum state. So these are really big objects. And due to this electron is far away from the, from the nucleus, uh, is very weakly bound, and by this, um, it has a hard time to find back to the ground state, which uh, leads to a long uh, lifetime, which can be on the order of milliseconds. So this is a really long time for the experiments. Typically, we do this on a microsecond scale, so this is a thousand times longer, so this is really basically staying there forever. And um, since this electron is so far away, it's very sensitive to what is happening in the environment. So if you apply a small electric field, this uh, loosely bound electron will feel this immediately, which leads to a polarizability, a large polarizability, which scales actually like to the seventh power of the main quantum number n. And for example, uh, if you apply one volt per centimeter, it's a very small field, you already get a shift of six uh, gigahertz. And if you compare this with the lifetime, so the lifetime is a, on the order of a millisecond, this corresponds to a line width of a kilohertz. So if you apply one volt per centimeter, you shift the line already a million times uh, of the line width. So it's very easy to manipulate this Rupert states with electric fields. And why actually uh, many people started the whole thing uh, with Rupert atoms is the Van der Waals interaction, which has this crazy scaling with the 11th power. So this is a, a extreme and I will tell you what happens then if you have this uh, extremely strong van der Waals interactions. So we had this slide already yesterday, where you can see that uh, the Rydberg atom, so here's the 100s state, that this interaction strength is a function of the radius. I mean, here you start out with van der Waals, and then you go to dipole-dipole. And of course, if you come up uh, with a quantum number at some point, of course, you will basically uh, approach uh, the Coulomb interaction. And so we are close to the Coulomb already, but not exactly. And the interesting thing about this Rubik's state, I mean, of course, they're very, very strong. At this, they are long range. Long range, uh, I will define in a second. Um, they're tunable. We just choose different states. We can have Van der Waals, dipole, dipole with different strengths. Switchable, because we can tune the, uh, the interaction strength either by electric fields, or we can just go to a Rubik's state and come back down. 
And they're anisotropic. I mean, if you have a dipole-dipole interaction, of course, they're anisotropic, but you also can have like dipole, quadrupolar, whatever interactions. So we really can shape uh, the azimuthal uh, interaction strength. And what do people want to use it for? And mostly, of course, I mean, it's uh, for quantum computing and quantum simulation. I mean, there are really groups uh, who seriously want to build a quantum computer out of these Rydberg atoms, and they're doing quite well. And another thing is like that people want to use these Rydberg atoms and combine it with quantum degenerate gases to get some of the interaction into a quantum gas to, to have more control options. And uh, a big field which has started now is like that you can use these Rydberg atoms by the interaction as an effective optical nonlinearity, which works down to the single photon level, and there have been single photon transistors and stuff like this already mm -hmm. demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Since uh, this is an experimental talk, I have to tell you how we do experiments. So typically, we start out with an uh, atom, for example, rubidium, and since the Rydberg state is energetically a little bit too far away, most people use a two-photon excitation. So they split the wavelength from a UV photon into two, and by this, we can go from an S state with an intermediate P state back to an S state, and the S state is the most simple one. And then everybody basically starts with the S state because there you can understand everything. What you need in this vacuum chamber is uh, most, most people use an ultra cold sample of atoms like uh, um, thermal clouds, but also Bose Einstein condensates or people going towards uh, degenerate Fermi gases. And then you have these laser pulses to excite them additional field plates, because we need these field plates to control these ripping atoms, but we also use them to, to apply a field pulse to rip out the electron and shoot the ripback atom then in the ion detection, the core, or the electron in the electron detection. And then uh, so after excitation pulse, we field ionize, and then we get a signal, and if there's been a ripback, then we know that we were successful. So let's come to the, uh, what I wanted to say is, uh, experiments till now with ultra-cold uh, Rydberg atoms have been done with rubidium, cesium, and strontium, but I would say worldwide we have about 25 groups or something like this working on cold Rydberg atoms. But in principle, whatever laser-cooled atom or whatever atom you can have in a BEC, you also can excite a Rydberg atom, and so people started to think about exciting erbium and dysprosium and, and stuff like this to Rydberg sets. So it's becoming very popular. So here... Uh, I have the thing which basically intrigued everybody to go into this field to do um, Rydberg physics. And what you see here is like you have um, two ground state atoms and at a distance r. And if you bring two ground state atoms together, then there's basically no interaction. There's a van der Waals interaction, which has something like 4,700 atomic unit strength, uh, which leads basically to the interaction uh, to the mean field in the Bose-Einstein condensate. On the scale we talk here, we don't see this at all. If you excite one of the atoms to a Rydberg atom and bring these two guys together, the interaction is still extremely weak. But if you excite both atoms to a Rydberg state, then the van der Waals interaction is now on the order of 10 to the 19, yes? So this is like 16 orders of magnitude larger than for the ground, ground state atoms. This is really visible. What happens now, if you bring two Rydberg atoms close together, they're getting shifted upwards. The, Van der Waals potential uh, is in this case repulsive, and uh, you shift upwards, and if you do this far enough, you cannot excite them anymore. So up to a certain distance, so if you, the atoms in the distance here, you have only a very small shift, and you are still within the line width of the laser, and you can excite the two Rydbergs, but if you come to a critical distance, which we call the blockade radius, from this point on, the laser has not enough intensity to excite the two Rydbergs, and you will only excite one of those. And this uh, length scale uh, is for typical parameters experiment. If you take a 43S state or something like this, and normal laser power is on the order of five microns. And this is actually a really long length scale because the distance in the Bose-Einstein condensate, for example, between the atoms is on the order of, let's say, below 100 nanometers. And then you have an effective um, interaction length of five microns. So this is much, much, much more longer than next neighbor, next, 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 next neighbor. So the picture is rather something like this, that you have one atom in a sphere, which you can excite a Rydberg, and the, this is a red one, and the blue one will not be excited due to this blockade effect. So you can have like hundreds or thousands of atoms within one blockade volume, which will not be excited. The effect is that 
you cannot say which atom in this blockade sphere will be excited. It can be either the first atom, the second, or third one. So what we will have is a excitation from this ground state to excited state with only one Rydberg atom. You have n of these states. It's basically a W state. And the interesting is, thing is that uh, the collective Rabi frequency here is enhanced by a square root of n. So this is what we call a super atom. Uh, you can see it. Then what, why is it super? First of all, it's super because it oscillates much faster than an ordinary two-level system. But it behaves like as a simple two-level system because you only can excite to one excited state. So it's an effective two-level system made of many, many, many atoms. And you can do experiments. Here's an example from the group uh, of Antoine Rovays in Paris that they have taken exactly one or two atom. If they do um, excitation of one Rydberg atom, that's a red line, so they have this situation here, and you have a Rabi coupling to this one Rydberg atom, and you just get the Rabi flopping, and you get a certain Rabi frequency. If you take two atoms, what you see is uh, the excitation probability is not going up to two, it stays uh, roughly up to one, but it oscillates uh, with the square root of two faster. So there, you really, can see that this interaction uh, is taking place in the experiments. And if you use this now, this situation uh, in a little bit more smart setup, you can build out of this a CNOT gate. And this is a building block for, for, for a quantum computer. You can do this also with more atoms. And there's a group of Immanuel Bloch in Munich. What they have is they have this uh, quantum gas microscope. So they can prepare square lattices, uh, 2D lattices of atoms. And they have done the experiment now uh, uh, up to 185 atoms up here. So what you see is here, if you have eight atoms, then you get uh, slow oscillations. If you take a 131, so this is a plaquette of 131 atoms, then you see the accordingly faster oscillations. And of course, the amplitude that's important stays, again, one. The damping here, actually, is not due to some funny interaction effects. It's basically, they have to do the experiment such. They prepare the atomic sample do the Rydberg excitation for a certain time, and then they have to read out the system, and uh, they have to check if the atom is excited or not excited, then it's over, they have to start over again. So they have to do this over and over again. And of course, you have some fluctuations uh, in this plaquette of how many atoms you have in there, and these fluctuations lead to different Rabi frequencies, and this leads to this T phasing. So these uh, Rabi oscillations are a clear manifestation of the of the van der Waals interaction uh, between these Rydberg atoms, which can take place. I mean, there has been a recent experiment by Barry Dunning in Rice University, where he went up to n equals 300. And the effective uh, range where this inter these two atoms see each other is 100 microns or 200 microns, which is an unbelievable distance for atomic physics, not for cosmology, but for our world, this is, I mean, a Bose-Einstein condensate is typically 100 micrometer long. So one atom from the one side sees the atom on the other side, if you would go to n equals 300. Now, I mean, you can have a um, van der Waals interaction, but of course you also can go to a resonant regime where you get dipole-dipole interaction. And what I have shown you here is like, here's a situation where I have two S states, and if you compute uh, the van der Waals interaction, then of course you have to think about the coupling to the neighboring states. Here, the S state can go up to a P prime state or a P state down here. And you see the distance between these two states is not equal. So if you put this in pair states, so you put two atoms there, so you have the SS state, then there's a P, P prime state. This is this state plus this state, which is uh, effectively, uh, we say, detuned. There's an energy defect in between these guys. So if you write down the hub coupling Hamiltonian, then you have like the dipole, uh, dipole inter, the dipole potential from going up and from going down. So there's d1, d2 divided by r cubed, as Igor has already shown. And there is this uh, defect here. So if you diagonalize this interaction Hamiltonian, then you see you have, on the one hand here, the detuning, and here the dipole-dipole interaction. If the detuning is very large, then you're in the van der Waals regime. Uh, you can expand this uh, square root, and then you get something which is like this thing squared. So you get the 1 over r to the 6 dependency. If this thing is 0, then you get a dipole-dipole interaction because the square root of this squared things uh, just gives the d1, d2 divided by r to the cube. 
So you can tune if you have a handle, and you have a handle, you can apply electric fields. I told you that these ripback states are very ele sensitive electric fields. So if you apply electric field, you can tune this detuning delta or this energy defect from a Fundawise regime to a regime where delta is equal zero to a dipole dipole regime, and you can do this on uh, for experimental cases on an infinite fast time scale. So it's really nice that you can tune from the one regime to a, you can switch on and off the dipole dipole interaction if you wish. And this has been done again in the group of Antoine Broys in Paris, where they have um, used a system. Now there's two D states. And the two states, uh, one goes uh, up to a P state, the other one goes out down to an F state. And they can uh, tune the distance between the atoms. The experiment is done such. They have here two microscopic traps. So these are two focused laser beams. And in each of these laser beams sits exactly one atom. And you can manipulate this laser foci. Uh, you can move them in, in space. And what they have done, they have measured the interaction strength, the dipole dipole interaction strength, as a function of distance. And you see here uh, the coupling strength, the dipole dipole energy, uh, uh, up to a distance of almost 15 microns. They still have something on the order of one megahertz coupling strength. So one megahertz is still uh, way sufficient to do experiments because we have lifetimes of many hundred microseconds. So you can do uh, many, many, many Rabi floppings during this time or coherent uh, operations. So this is actually, again, I mean, this is a quite large distance. You have two atoms talking coherently to each other over a distance of five, uh, 15 microns. And now, um, of course, I mean, if you have this two-body first resonances, you can think also of going like having three, four, or more order first resonances. And there have been some experiments. The plot is a little bit more difficult on the left. It shows the energy scheme. But what you should see here is like there are five atoms. Two go down, three go up. And if you do it in a smart enough way, all energies uh, compensate. That this energy defect becomes zero. And you can have a five-body first resonance. It's not very visible. This is a little peak here. But uh, if you read the paper, it's convincing. But uh, the nice thing is like you can really make two-body, three-body, four-body, five-body. I mean, this was done in a, in a, in a cloud, in a thermal cloud. Uh, if you would do this in a nicely arranged uh, pattern, as the other group in Paris is doing, then this you can isolate this peak from everything, because this is just a question of configurations you have in a thermal cloud. So you have many, many options to, to play with these interactions. And I think many body interactions uh, might be perhaps interesting for someone here. And now I want to come back to uh, Rippeck atoms. So Rippeck atoms look something like this. In reality, it's not just like this one electron flying on a, on a Pluto-type orbit around the nucleus. Um, so you have here the wave functions. And now, I mean, I was talking about on a length scale. So this is the length scale of the Rippeck atom. This scales quadratically with the main quantum number. And we have this blockade or interaction radius. So let's say this on the order of 100 nanometers. And we have something uh, uh, effective range of 10 micrometers. So this is a factor 100 in this way, where these two Rippeck atoms still see each other. But if you increase the density, I mean, if you go to a Bose-Einstein condensate, then the inter-particle distance becomes comparable to the size of this Rippeck atom. And what then happens is that ground state atoms happen to sit within the wave function of the Rippeck atom. And you might think this will kill the thing immediately, but actually it does not. Actually, it does something nice. So the situation is something like this. You have uh, the ionic core, the electron, now orbiting again. and there's this ground set atom in its way. What happens? Of course, the electron is bound to the core by the Coulomb interaction. But there's a scattering between the electron and the ground set atom. And actually, uh, this is a, a very slow, uh, small energy scattering. So this actually happens in the S-wave scattering regime. So you have to do a quantum mechanical treatment of this thing. And actually, this scattering of the electron and this ground set atom leads to a binding mechanism which binds the green ground set atom to the Rippeck atom, and this makes a dimer. The idea was brought up by Chris Green, Dickinson, and Zadekpur already in 2000, where they have uh, made a quantum mechanical description of the thing. And uh, actually, these pictures became quite famous. They're called trilobite molecules because they look a little bit like trilobites. And uh, of course, uh, we can produce this kind of trilobite molecules, but I'm not showing you the trilobite. I'm showing you the, the most simple version of it. So let me just carry you through the idea how these Rippeck molecules actually come to life. So what we have is 
the interaction potential between the electron and the neutral atom. And the neutral atom, of course, has a quadratic polarizability with the electric field. And since the electric field drops uh, quadratically with the distance of the, of the electron, you have an effective interaction potential which goes 1 over r to the 4. And in this 1 over r to the 4 potential, you can do just an ordinary scattering theory, uh, like by partial wave decomposition. And then you get uh, a scattering length out of this, uh, which is momentum dependent. It's A of k. This is a scattering length. And then you apply uh, the Fermi pseudopotential to, have the, to get the interaction between this electron and this ground set atom. So it's just a delta function times the scattering length. And the, the scattering length uh, actually has a, a, a velocity dependency. So we have a background scattering length of A naught, which is actually negative in our case. And then there's a linear correction with the velocity and higher order terms. And the velocity, here we are more or less classical. We just take a, um, a classical energy. So this is the energy where the electron starts in the Coulomb potential. And then we just basically take the 1 over r Coulomb potential to get the, the kinetic energy at a certain point. So we just use the classical velocity to get this momentum. So this is a little approximation, but it works quite nice. What you then do? is you take the density, the probability density of the electron, and you take the scattering length, which is negative at zero velocity, and then you have this linear correction. And it's, of course, not linear, because the motion in the one of our potential is not uh, linear. And you have to multiply these two things. It's basically a mean field approximation. So we have this uh, scattering length time the density of the electron wave function, which gives this uh, potential landscape here. And this potential landscape, uh, it's a simple 1D problem. You take this one and you uh, use a 1D solver, and then you see that you can have bound states in this uh, potential landscape. And there's something like ground state and something which we call the first excited state. Looks like vibrational states. So it's a very simple model, yes? We just say the interaction energy is proportional to the density of the electron you find at a certain position. And the uh, scattering length is velocity dependent. And if you put this together, you come to this very, very simple picture. Now we want to see this, guys. What we do is we take, um, again, our two photons to do excitation. And if we want to excite a Rydberg atom, then we just go right on resonance here. And then we see, like, here two lines because we have two spin components. And then you see two atomic lines. But if you want to see this Rydberg molecules, you have to detune the upper laser. You go down and you photo associate this, this state here, this dimer state. This state here exactly corresponds to this state here. And then you see there are some excited states, uh, which corresponds to a state here. And there's another state lying up here. It's a little bit more complicated in this picture. And the funny thing is, like if you look at this position here and you go twice the energy, you find another peak. And this peak is actually a trimer state. So, if you increase the density accordingly, you can have more and more ground set atoms sitting uh, in the wave function, and you can photo associate dimer, trimer, tetramer, and higher order states. So the question is, what happens if you increase, dense, uh, increase the principal quantum number? So, I mean, we have done this for, let's say, in the regime of 30 or 40, but of course, we have this knob, so we use all knobs. So one knob is uh, the principal quantum number. So what you see here is like this effective potentials for n equals 51. And of course, if you increase the quantum number, the potential is getting, the Rydberg atom is getting bigger and bigger. And of course, uh, the density of the electron is getting more and more shallow. And the potentials are also getting uh, less and less deep, which means that uh, the bounding energy for this ground state molecules uh, will become smaller and smaller. And if you do this experiment, then you see something like this. You have here the state, this is, this is the 51. So you see nicely here this dimer state. And if you go already to 62, it moves in, and it becomes smaller and smaller. But the interesting thing is, you see the, the dimer, trimer, tetramer, pentramer. You can see all these states. But then at some point, I mean, they move closer and closer together, and you cannot see anything anymore. You just get a hump on the side. And the hump on the side uh, is basically all the unresolved molecular lines. And why do we see this hump? Because we leave the density constant. If I come back to this picture, I mean, we have a certain probability to find ground set atoms in here. But of course, if the Rydberg atom is much bigger, the same density, you get much, many, many more ground set atoms in there. And the interesting thing is, if you compute it, you see that the center of gravity 
of this ring of the left, this molecular ring, basically stays more or less constant. Because of the scaling, I mean, uh, the density goes down, but the volume goes accordingly up, and these two things just compensate such that you get a constant, what we call a density shift. We were very excited about this until we learned that people have done this already uh, 80 years ago. So there's a data from Rostock in 1934. They had exactly the same experiment with uh, vapor lamps. So they have taken vapor lamps, and you see these Rupert lines of sodium or what was this here? Uh, actually, sodium and potassium. And then they added an additional gas. And what they see is uh, that for the main quantum number, at the beginning, uh, there are changes. But after some time, actually, it stays constant. And actually, the funny thing is that you get uh, red shift or blue shifts depending on what kind of buffer gas you use. So this is actually a little bit funny. So if you would use some polarizability models, you would only shift, expect shifts in one direction. But as we have learned, the scattering length, yeah? can be, of course, positive and negative. And the funny thing is that Enrico Fermi developed his pseudo-potential to explain data like this. Because I have seen this red and blue shifts, and they couldn't explain it. And they say, OK, we take uh, effective potential, the pseudo-potential, and we can have it positive and negative. So this is the invention of the pseudo-potential. OK, the last parameter I want to show you we can shift is, of course, we can increase the quantum number, but we also can increase the density. And all the data I've shown us was a thermal cloud, but we wanted to go to, really, uh, to a really dense regime where we um, uh, have, of course, a both einstein condensate. And what we do is actually an experiment that we really excite only in the densest regime. We have an excitation laser which we actually poke into the, this is a both einstein condensate, and we have a laser which we poke through the center of the BEC, and what you see is uh, uh, that, yeah, it's hard to see, but the, the Rydberg atom, the 111 S state, for example, is almost the size of the BC. It's like a, a sphere like this. And if you do this experiment now, again, as before, this as a function of, oops, one direction, of detuning, then you see that you have now a density shift. Before the density shift was only on the order of a megahertz. Now you get density shifts on the order of 40, 50 uh, megahertz. Of course, uh, many, many more atoms inside the density shift becomes longer. The funny thing was here that uh, our simple model, you know, what I have shown you, like the multiplication of the scattering length time, the density of the Rydberg wave function, this would give a line shape uh, something like this. But this is certainly not true. What you have to do is you have to not only include uh, S-wave and P-wave scattering. The interesting thing is that in this uh, P-wave scattering, there's a shape resonant happening. And this shape resonant uh, does something ugly to the, to the molecular lines. So what you see here is a the line of a 53 S-state and this ground set atom. And this is now enlarged by a factor of 1,000. So there's this little wiggles somewhere here uh, in this region where we have this traditional bound states. But due to a shape resonance, exactly at this point where the, uh, the, the, the electron has the right velocity, you have the shape resonance. And it basically, it drags down states from the hydrogen manifold. And you get something like an avoided crossing here. And, if, and a new funny states like this trilobite state. So this one we have discussed already before. Oh, I've shown you this picture from this Hossein uh, Sadekpur screen paper. But they're also like something like butterfly states, and they have all these nice names. And all these states have been now already um, spectroscopically identified or excited. But uh, let's, for this case now here in the BC, let's have a look at this uh, crossing here. What you see is the blue line is this traditional potential I was showing you. Then here you have the C4 or R to the 4 potential of the ground set atom with the charged nucleus. And then uh, due to this uh, scattering resonance, you get here. Um, um, energies in this potential energy landscape, uh, which uh, allows to have much larger energies on the red side, but also on the blue side. And if you look at the data, there's some wing to the blue side, but also this large wing to the red side. And this, this wings and this wings here is due to atoms which uh, happen to lie in uh, this position or this position. So we model the whole thing by just throwing uh, randomly Poisson distributed atoms in uh, according to the distance and uh, to the density, and then we, we get this nice agreement. And uh, this one, I mean, every, every of this, uh, if we put the atom here, then this has, for example, like this kind of butterfly shape. So if we only excite this guy here, then we are pretty sure oops, that we have excited uh, some. So this atoms, if we excite here, some Rydbergs, then they have looked like this before. 
Okay. Uh, what you can do with this, I mean, as this uh, density shift, of course, depends on the density, and we can have a laser well focused into the BEC. What we have done is experiment. We just took the laser beam and was uh, go, uh, going with the laser beam through a BEC and did spectra. And what you see, if you, for example, um, so this is the distance. So we move the laser from the, through the BEC. And if you have a large detuning, like minus 55 megahertz, then we know that we only can uh, talk to a regime where we are very dense. So you get uh, only in the center of the BEC real excitations, and we only have a small detuning. Then you see that we only can excite in the wings. In the center, we, it's too dense. We cannot excite. And then you can use this as a density tomography for, for a BEC, or you, if you want to do some excitation in a specific regime of a BEC, you just dial in the right detuning, and they can be sure that you're in the center of the BEC or on the wings. OK, so um, finally, perhaps just uh, the other knob we have is not the main quantum number, but we also can change the angular momentum. And I want just to show you more colorful pictures. So we have also uh, switched to D states. So the S state molecule I have shown you before, but the D state molecule, of course, you have more shapes to choose from. And I just want to show you the, uh, the spectroscopy of the MJ1 half state. So you have this dumbbell thing where you have like this torus uh, around here and this big dumbbell. So there's a large electron density here and a small electron density here. So if you look at the, uh, at the potentials, then you see that you have very deep potentials here and here and very shallow potentials here. And if you do spectroscopy like this photo association of Rydberg molecules, you can excite either states which uh, are weakly bound, so they're living in this low density regime here, or you can excite states which are deeply bound, which live uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this big lobes uh, up and down. So what you can do with this, you can basically produce uh, um, aligned states of molecules. So aligned means like that all uh, molecules are either oriented like this, or you can use um, uh, anti-aligned states. If you go to this torus here, then all, uh, all the molecules are lying in a plane. And the funny thing is what you could do, which we have not done, if you start to hybridize these molecules by bringing two different uh, angular momentum states uh, together by electric field, you could even think about getting to aligned and orientated uh, atoms such that the, the, the core, the Rydberg core, is sitting here and that the, the neutral atom is sitting always on top of it. So you can really think about making aligned and oriented samples of molecules. OK, so this brings me to the end in this very quick talk. Uh, the summary, I have only two messages for you. You can have. Uh, van der Waals and dipole-dipole interactions uh, in the system, and they are long range in, in, in terms of that they can have, that they can talk uh, uh, one million atoms further downstream. Uh, you can have uh, interactions there. And this is what we call long range. And the other thing is that we can have these Rydberg molecules, and I've shown you the D state because um, uh, in the outlook, I want to show you that what you could do so let's have a look here. So I have shown you the D states. And the interesting thing about the D state is we would like to use this as a, as a uh, tool to probe correlations in a quantum gas. Because uh, if we have, like, for example, excite this kind of molecule, this is a dimer state, and then one atom would sit here and one atom sits here. So we have a measure for the probability to find two atoms at a certain distance. So this might be a very useful tool if you go to like some degenerate Fermi gases. You really can look in space what are the, the G2 or G3. I mean, if you have two dimer, trimer, tetramer, we can go to higher order correlation functions and perhaps learn what's going on. And the interesting thing is here, I mean, uh, the quantum gas microscope can look in a 2D system, but it's very finite. It's like 20 by 20 atoms or something like this. This thing you can use in a bulk ensemble because you can do it in the middle of the system. And I think this has some potential. Another thing we would like to do is we want to, uh, this, what I have not told you is that this Rydberg atoms, I mean, we have an interaction between the ground state atoms and the Rydberg wave function, which of course means if I put a Rydberg atom into a BEC, also the atoms of the BEC will start to, to roll into the Rydberg wave function because it's an attractive potential. And if you do a simulation uh, of, uh, this is a BEC, and we have placed in one of these D-state molecules, and then you let the system evolve for some time, then of course the, the superfluid 
fraction will flow into the Rydberg atom, and if you stop at a certain time, you can have an imprint of a Rydberg atom in a BC, and if you then do a phase contrast imaging, you should be able to make a picture of an atom, which is uh, the big goal, what we want to do. And last thing here, I mean, what we also were thinking about, I mean, we would like to have a very highly excited, say, Rydberg state, such that the electron lives outside of the Bose-Einstein condensate, so it acts like a Faraday cage, and then we have an ion sitting inside the BEC, and then we can look at the coupling of ions uh, with the like ground set atoms and do some kind of polaroid physics. So you see there the are more things to do, more long range or less long range. And the last slide, as I said, everybody has his own long range meeting. So we had a long range meeting which was mostly dedicated to dipolar systems, so the dipolar BECs and the Rydberg systems. But I've seen uh, now what kind of other long range system are there and I hope that uh, I will see some of you people next year in the Herreus seminar in Bad Honnef in Germany, uh, which will be in October 25 to 27. And we have no program, no speakers yet, but uh, we will start to organize this. And I, I think we should have a large fraction of you guys here, no? and you will hear from us. Okay, so now this is really the end.